due to lacking confidence and battling common insecurities. These discussions topic centered around career, marriage, and raising a family. Claudia reached a point in her life where she was seeking more and asked a colleague at work where she attended church. A few months later, this question led to Claudia studying the Bible and getting baptized in May of 2000. Upon being baptized, she had a new sense of purpose and a focus that led her to pursuing a lifelong dream of living and working in New York City. While living there, I visited her and saw the great friendships she had formed with disciples. And it was the in-depth conversations I had with several disciples in New York that challenged me to really think about my own purposes in life. These conversations followed me back home after my New York visit as a few of the disciples would frequently call me and encourage me to grow in my understanding of what it meant to give my life over to God. Inspired uh, to learn more, I studied the Bible a few months later and got baptized in February of 2002 because I ultimately realized that I was not able to fulfill the values that were instilled in me throughout my adolescence. I found myself as I got older continuously compromising my own beliefs and values for selfish gains. My value system was one of selfishness and dishonesty. For example, I would often tell myself not to take part in something, but found myself frequently giving in. I would give in during the moment to dishonesty, deceit, and lying. I lacked a moral compass with dating and who I was often associating with. I was consumed in trying to present myself as more well-rounded than I really was. And when I studied the cross, I realized that my shortcomings led me astray of my beliefs because I gave in to the temptations and desires of this world and learned I was never really the person that I worked hard to project on others as being a typical down-to-earth nice guy. When I, I remember when I studied the cross one night after midweek where God placed so many challenging thoughts on my mind and heart and somehow God still revealed to me that it was only through a relationship with Jesus and having his spirit that can enable me to live a life of decency and contentment. Realizing that I was someone who had far more shortcomings and deceit than I realized, I wanted a sense of pur purpose, peace, and forgiveness. So I decided to give baptized. Eventually, during the process, my friendship with Claudia strengthened. The cross provided me a true sense of foundation and the ultimate standard to live by. We learned to value and respect boundaries in our friendship and grow a relationship with God together. At this time, Claudia would, uh, would like to share. <laughs> Thanks, Richie. Um, hello, church. Well, um, I'm happy to share with you my outlook on life prior to becoming a Christian and the events that led me to understanding the cross. Um, prior to becoming a Christian, Richard pointed out to me that although I was fun and positive when we were just friends, I too was filled with doubts. I was fearful of life's commitments just as he was, and if I was honest, he was definitely right. Our biggest fear in life was the commitment of marriage and having a healthy marriage at that. Um, I actually had a lot of fear that I would share with him through our friendship. Fears from the strains that we would see in marriages, the challenges in having children, and just in the relationships we experienced while dating other people. I eventually got to the point where I sought peace and understanding that I knew only the scriptures could provide, having gone to church occasionally growing up. I also was given a small Bible um, in college as I walked to class. I was handed this tiny little Bible from a group that was just giving them out, and I just grabbed it and threw it in my backpack. Well, this tiny little Bible eventually ended up on my bedside table that I often took out to read. This little Bible helped me through times when it seemed like I was never able to find any moral standards in relationships. But even though I had that Bible, I, my, my heart was still being hardened over time because I was just always expecting to be disappointed. With these low expectations, this, these led me to not taking any relationship seriously and then just giving into sin. I always seemed to find myself losing when I, I always just wanted to win. It's always just really, really tough times. However, what God taught me was that a relationship with him was not only loving and true, but eternal, and one that I could hold on to as I learned about Jesus. It was a relationship that became real, and yet one that showed me that um, the effects of my sin and, and 
what was happening with that, right? But the fact that God still accepted me, even with all my sin, that that's what uh, forever changed my life. Um, it has been through my relationship with God that I was able to trust that my relationship with Richard could be one that could stand. And as we trusted in his guidance and compassion together, Richard and I got married in March of 2003 on a rare stormy day where not everything went as planned. However, we were filled with joy and gratitude that a day like that could be fulfilled with God's grace and love. Richard is now going to share a scripture that is personal to both of us and allows us to reflect on what the cross means to us. Thank you, Claudia. Though one may be overpowered, uh, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes 4.12 With the help of the Lords, we are inspired by many other marriages and the faith that we can always look up to and seek guidance. Things we never had before when we were not Christians. Together with the Lord, we aspire to reach out and share his message with others. We are also inspired to give hope and a future to others who may be experiencing what we were living with before learning about the cross. At this time, I'll close in prayer. God, we give thanks to you for providing us the gift of salvation through our relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood as an atonement for our sins so that we can live with the gift of grace that is from you. I pray today that all of us believers can stand united in our faith and we can recognize during these uncertain times that only you can provide us with peace through the, our righteousness and relationship with you. And just as in the scripture, Philippians 4, 7, in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thanks, Thank guys. You, church. Thank you.
Three, two. Hey, Westside Church. Uh, thank you for your patience this morning. A little bit of technical challenge, and I'm sorry you couldn't hear Sarah. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to have Sarah come on up right now. I think you need to hear Sarah. Uh, she did an amazing welcome. Sarah, come on up here. Just say hi to the congregation. Hi everyone, good morning. It really is great to be here together and I'm sure Steve's gonna have a great message. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties. Awesome, thanks. Let's give it up for Sarah. She did do an awesome welcome. Uh, we were working out the kinks. Um, today the title of the le lesson is A Radical Transfer of Power. And you know, God's been working in a powerful way across the country. I'm really grateful for the Castros leading this in communion, and I really do see uh, God has a great plan for each one of us. But uh, we're going to ask God to really work in a powerful way, and today I really want us to be thinking, we're going to do a two-part series about what the real transfer of power in our life needs to be. You know, America has experienced 44 peaceful transfers of power between presidents, our long tradition of peaceful transition was most threatened, uh, up until now at least, uh, 20 years ago when the presidential election ended in a dead heat, uh, with Gore uh, having the popular vote uh, winning by 500,000 votes. But as election night ended 20 years ago, Bush had 246 electoral votes and Gore had 266. But the state of Florida was too close to call. And so... Um, they had to do recounts over and over, and we got familiar with this idea of a hanging chad because back then the way the votes worked is you'd punch a hole in the voter card, and if you didn't punch it correctly, it created problems with the counting machine. It was very controversial. They recounted multiple times, and the case ended uh, in the Supreme Court in order to end the recounts, and a Republican majority court ruled in favor of Bush five to four, uh, what was really, I think, inspiring was that Al Gore conceded quickly and publicly. And what he said in his concession speech was inspiring. He said, this has been an extraordinary election, but in one of God's unforeseen paths, this belatedly broken impasse can point us all to a new common ground. For its very closeness can serve to remind us that we are one people with a shared history and a shared destiny. Indeed, that history gives us many examples of contests as hotly debated, as fiercely fought with their own challenges to the popular will. Other disputes have dragged on for weeks before reaching resolution. And each time, both the victor and the vanquished have accepted the result peacefully and in a spirit of reconciliation. So let it be with us. Today, I want to begin our lesson on a radical transfer of power with a prayer for peaceful transition in the United States, but also that we undergo a powerful and radical transfer of power in our own lives, giving ourselves to the one true King. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time to be here to worship. Father, we know that um, difficulties occur both technologically, but also uh, in our own lives and in our country and all over the world. And you work through those. We do want to ask for a true peaceful transfer of power in America. And Father, we pray for a radical transfer of power in the lives of each individual today, worshiping and looking to you. Pray you bless our lesson today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today is part one of a radical transfer of power. Next week will be part two. And today the title is Another King, Radical Transfer of Power to the True King is our goal. You know, just before the birth of Jesus and after the murder of Julius Caesar back in history, Octavian consolidated power in Rome through decisive military battles over Brutus, Cassius, Mark Antony, and Cleopatra. And as he neared uh, taking ownership and power over Rome, he assumed the title of Augustus Caesar in 27 BC. He became the first emperor of Rome. 
You know, coins minted during this time bore the image of Julius Caesar on one side and Augustus on the reverse with the designation of Son of God. And you can see the actual coin right there with Julius Caesar being known as the Divine Lord. And of course, this instigated uh, among the kingdom the standard of saying a pledge of allegiance and loyalty to the subjects of the empire by saying Caesar is Lord. And it became a great proclamation of patriotism through the Roman Empire. Of course, simultaneously with that, a new king was established in the first century, Jesus. And you have the classic battle between Caesar is Lord and Jesus is Lord. Of course, Jesus is Lord became the baptismal confession for those following the new king. So what I want to ask you guys is uh, when did you, if you're watching today, if you are a Jesus follower, when did you say Jesus is Lord? For me, it was October 15th, 1990. Maybe you could put that in the chat right now. When did you say Jesus is Lord before your baptism? And I think that'll be interesting to see uh, just the, the, the different decades that are, that are spanned with people giving their life to the true king. You know, the transfer of power to Jesus is the great spiritual battle of all the ages now. And we find in 49 AD that Paul began his missionary journeys uh, into Philippi and towards Thessalonica. And he uses the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia as rest stops along the way because they didn't have a synagogue, but uh, Thessalonica did. And so let's begin to read about this today as we look at this radical transfer of power taking place in the Roman Empire as a new king is established. So we'll begin to read in Acts chapter 17. We read there, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the Jewish synagogue. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. You know, when a municipality or a city or a community shifts its allegiance to a new and unlikely king, it does create some turmoil. It turns the world upside down. You know, I remember in 1995, Carrie and I had the privilege of going to uh, Johannesburg, South Africa for a world conference with our fellowship of churches. And the year before, in 1994, Nelson Mandela had been elected the, the president, the first black president of South Africa. And of course, he helped lead the way to the abolishment of apartheid uh, in 1990. He had been freed from prison, had been a political prisoner. And he led the way to a new constitution being written there and then ascending to the presidency and really uh, fulfilling the dreams of so many in South Africa. But it created turmoil in the country. And I remember flying in uh, that summer of 1995 and we took a bus from the airport to the hotel in downtown Johannesburg. 
Uh, when we got off the bus, there was great commotion. People were walking around with shotguns, uh, combat boots, army officers. I saw a guy run by with a pistol, and I was like, I'm, I was scared. As a, a new mar married guy, had my wife with me, my young wife. We're in this foreign country. There's turmoil and commotion. They told us to rush right into the hotel, which we did, and we got this notification that um, we should not leave the hotel. Uh, members of delegates of the conference have already ha been mugged outside. Do not leave. And we realized, wow, uh, there's a lot of turmoil in this country. There's sort of a revolution going on. And really, when we change allegiances in life, a revolution does take place in our own life, actually. Uh, the truth of the matter is the greatest revolution, the greatest transference of power is when it happens in our own life. Right? When we realize that there is a greater king than ourselves or worldly accomplishment. And I know for me, uh, like I shared, this happened in 1990, October 15th of 1990. I went through this radical transfer of power, giving ownership of my life to Jesus instead of myself. And the truth is, I was my own Lord for all of my life until I was 23 years old. And repentance is a huge transfer of power. Uh, I was arrogant. I was living an empty life. Uh, I had to give up uh, sexual indiscretions for sexual purity. I had to give up chasing money for fishing for men. Uh, I had to give up the American dream for God's dreams. And for me, that meant ultimately giving up a, a self-gratification and a self-glorification as the primary motivators of my life. Uh, I remember giving up self-gratification. Uh, yes, it involved the, the big sins, giving those things up, uh, the things that were actually hurting me more than helping me. And um, the other thing that was really big was this idea of who should get the glory? Is it me? Should it be about pro uh, promoting my own life? So I had to give up self-glorification and look for the glory of God to be revealed. And it really, I have to say this for me, uh, it was the self-glorification that was the hard part. It was the giving up of the dream. You know, for me, I wanted to become a multimillionaire by the time I was 30. I was working in, in finance. I had a, a, a mentor who was 30 years old and he was already a multimillionaire. And I had a plan. But I realized when I saw that Jesus is the real king, and that eternal life is real. That I had to give up the ambition, the selfish ambition, the seeking of self-glorification and desire the honoring of God and whatever came with that. And I, it doesn't mean it's wrong to uh, use your gifts and be great stewards of our money and earn money and do well. But our desire needs to be to glorify God and not ourselves. And I had to surrender that ambition. I never dreamed. I, it wasn't, I didn't grow up thinking, I'll someday be a gospel minister. That wasn't my dream growing up. But God transferred his dream into my heart when I understood that Jesus was the real king. For you out there today watching, I want you to put in the chat, is your greatest struggle self-gratification? Do you have to transfer the power of wanting self-gratification? Or is it more maybe like me, self-glorification? Uh, both are challenges. I think they're struggles that go on throughout our life. And I do want to bring that up. The reality is that repentance is a full-scale self-revolution. It changes every affection, allegiance, agenda, appetite, and ambition in our life. It begins in the mind and heart, but pervades every outward expression of our whole existence. It topples the throne of me and puts Jesus in charge. We don't live with the motto, I am Lord, which I clearly did and still struggle with that at times. Instead, when we transfer power really to this true king that Paul uh, went on a mission to, to preach and teach and install that kingship throughout the world, when we make that commitment, we say Jesus is Lord with our mouth and also with our heart. Today, the question for you guys is, have you transferred power to Jesus? And it's not a one-time thing. 
It's an ongoing transfer of power. You know, in our American elections, there's a, a new presidential election every four years. And like this year, transfer of power needs to take place. I think in our own spiritual lives, a transfer of power doesn't take place only one time. We have to continue to renew our commitment to the true king. I know for me, I became a minister uh, 26 years ago. And the temptation for selfish ambition keeps trying to whittle its way back into my heart. And so, yes, I'm certainly not seeking the American dream of great wealth, but I certainly would love the American dream of a, a huge church, uh, successful in all that we do in the church world. And God really taught me, even last summer, he taught me it's, it's not about me. It's not about achievement. Many in our group did the Enneagram studies to look at our, our natural dispositions. And mine was a three, uh, like the nation of achievers. I'm a natural achiever. And last summer, God had to teach me a lesson. He, he um, allowed my back to go out. Uh, I was on, in the hospital for a week. Um, and the lesson I learned was that I don't have to win a human game. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be the greatest at everything I do. And I will confess, when, even when I play my 10-year-old in basketball, I, I often struggle with wanting to beat him. I usually beat him. He beats me sometimes. But I realize it's about relationship. It's about patience. I had a great talk this week with the dear brother and sister just about having the patience to listen, um, being willing to really struggle and sit with people and learn the lesson. In America, we're learning so many lessons We've learned the lesson of listening and caring and feeling about the pain that so many of our black brothers and sisters have felt for generations. And it's so easy for us to want to say, okay, I learned that lesson. Let's go on to a new lesson. And I want to urge all of us to transfer the power to Jesus. And his heart was the perfect heart of empathy and listening and being willing to care at all times. And I think caring and loving the way Jesus loved is a mark of whether or not you've transferred power to Jesus. We really do need to care. And caring never ends. And there's a time to grieve. And there's a time to rejoice. And there's a time to really care for each other in whatever situation they're in. To be patient. To listen. To accept mistakes of one another. Today, ask yourself, have you transferred power to Jesus. You know, I want to go back to these uh, coins. You know, the coins back in the Roman Empire showed the image of Caesar and that he is the son of God. And they brought this inscription and message and implanted them into the hearts of the people in that generation where they would say, Caesar is Lord. But God has a much stronger plan for you and I. We are much more valuable than gold and silver. And I want to show you something right here. Uh, I have a $100 bill and a $50 bill, all right? And on these bills, we have uh, Ulysses S. Grant, you know, 18th president of the United States. His, you know, his picture is actually inscribed there. On this $100 bill, we have, you know, Benjamin Franklin. He wasn't a president, but he was a founding father of the nation. And these inscriptions, these pictures, these images, uh, we see them all the time when we spend money, which we do every day. And here's some silver coins. I brought some uh, actual silver, one ounce silver coins. These are worth about 25 bucks each. These actually have, uh, these aren't actual currency. They're just silver coins printed and looking like a, a coin. They're actually not, you can't spend them, but the weight of the silver has weight and value in it. And you know, in the world, we put our hope in money, and the inscription written on the lives of people is that Caesar is Lord, money is king, and that the American dream is the answer. The reality is that God has intended uh, some way more valuable entity to bring his inscription and his image and his imprint into society, and that is you and I. As we see in Genesis chapter 1, we know this verse. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. You 
are to be the image bearer of this new king. You are to have this new king imprinted upon you. And you are to have his inscription imprinted upon you that Jesus is Lord. And I love the passage. One of the reasons I love following Jesus is he could handle any difficulty. And he's so inspiring. And he handled conflict masterfully. They were trying to trap him in Matthew chapter 22. And I'll read in verse 17. I I don't have all of verse 17 on the screen, but it says, Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And so they had come to trap him. If he says, yeah, you pay the tax, then he is violating and he will not gain popularity and influence with those who are Jews who say you should only serve God. And if he says, hey, um, no, don't pay it, then of course he's violating the Roman law. And so knowing their evil intent, he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You see, when we undergo a radical transfer of power in our own lives and give it to him, we create a revolution. And it occurs even in our society when people see that we carry a new inscription in our life, that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God's. Here's what is God's. You and I are God's. We were made in his image and are to give back to him our hearts, our lives, our minds, our resources, our time, and our talent. And then we are the currency he uses to transform the world. Today, I hope that you are thinking about wanting America to have a peaceful transition of power. But really, each of us needs to undergo a radical transfer of power, of selfishness, of self-glorification, self-gratification, and give it to Jesus. He is worth it. He is the one true king. He's proved it. And I believe fundamentally he's alive, absolutely alive. He can hear us. He can see what's going on in the world. The scriptures are clear. Someday he will return. So the question for each of us today, and I know we're going to break into uh, some groups later. Those that are watching, we break into small groups as a congregation. But there's questions I want us to ask ourselves and evaluate. We can have some discussions. What part of your life is most challenging to transfer power over to Jesus and why? And how are you doing revealing God's image and God's message? Thank you for joining us today. Uh, God is working. Next week, we're going to talk about part two, a radical transfer of power. We're going to talk about the kingdom, another kingdom that exists right now on earth and will be here for eternity that we get to be a part of and is radical to be a part of it, something God has worked on for generations. Let's go to God in prayer right now and ask again for peace, both in our nation, but as well in our own hearts. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to really be a part of something incredibly uh, powerful. And that is recognizing that Jesus is the true king. Uh, Father, I pray that we can undergo a radical transfer of power in our own life. I pray, God, that those areas of our life that we're unwilling to uh, surrender to your son, we would be willing to do so. We would ask for help on how to do so. And Father, we pray that we would really be image bearers carrying your inscription and your message that we give our hearts back to you. Father, thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing, Steve. Um, It was so great just to hear about your journey and this radical transformation of power. And I know it's difficult to be able to transfer this power from a previous feeling or thought or emotion or worldview to God. But being able to do that is so, so important. And even thinking about what's going on in our nation, it's incredible 
how we've done this for so long. Um, but it's, I think it's symbolic of what God wants us to do in our pen. So thank you again, Steve. Really grateful just for your message. And I was looking at the chat, and it was cool to see some of your responses. Even we talked about, uh, is it harder to overcome self-glorification or self-gratification? And I just, perusing through the chat, chat, I saw Kenzie and Emma and Oscar and just different people putting in their responses. And uh, some, of you, some of you said both, which is really cool. I think for me, it's definitely self-gratification. Um, and just the idea that I want to feel good and have things go my way all the time. Uh, but being able to surrender that to God is extremely difficult. And we were able to connect on that. Uh, even when Steve talked about beating his 10-year-old in basketball, I'm like, dang, you know? But we all have that kind of desire uh, in some way, shape, or form. And then lastly, the question Steve asked about, have you transferred your power to Jesus? Or have you transferred your allegiance to Jesus? And I really appreciated, Robin, your, your response. You said, I have to transfer and surrender the power of fear to him every day. Every day. And that is the calling of those of us who've committed to call ourselves Christians. Every single day, we have this transfer of power. It's a continual process. So thank you guys for sharing in the chat. We're just super grateful uh, to have that interaction. And now what we're going to do is we're going to hear from Mofe Alege as he shares the offering. Are we good? Good morning, Westside. My name is Mofe Alege, and I'm a part of the Young Professionals Ministry here. I was baptized here four years ago as part of the campus ministry and have since graduated and transitioned to the Young Professionals. I've been tasked this morning with leading our thoughts and contribution. If you could please turn your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, I'll be reading from there. The Bible reads, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I know for myself, I am not naturally a generous person. I'm naturally pretty miserly and often focused on my own capital accumulation and storing up treasures for myself. And I really appreciate and feel challenged by this scripture because the truth is God's definitely given so many of us so much more than what we really need to get by. And it's all his in the first place. And he's not asking us to give everything. He's not asking us to not have anything left over so that we can uh, enjoy our lives, but he's calling us to, to give freely out of what he's already given to us. And just, I wanted to encourage you guys in light of the fact that you know, God is a God who, who gives us so much more than what we need. He meets our needs in every single way. And he's asking us to really examine our hearts and to give in a way that shows our reverence for who he is and, and what he's done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence, to think about you, to think about um, the ways which you give to us time and time and again. Father, please help us to have hearts that are open and willing to, to give out of, of what you've given to us, Lord. I pray that we could really think about the needs that we can help meet, Father, in, in whatever capacity that we can, Lord. I just pray that you could please help us to, to be cheerful givers. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There are three ways in which you can give. First, you can text GIVE to 855-575-8767. Type in tithe.link on any mobile device or any computer, and that will allow you to have access to the Tithely app. And lastly, you can visit the westsidechurch.com in order to give online. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Kenny again, and we're back. Uh, we're going to close out service. Thank you all for joining and, and tuning in to our service. I know we had some technical difficulties earlier, but it's great that we're able to work through that. Uh, so please, if you like the, the message today, just press like and also subscribe. We want to get as many subscriptions as possible. So please, 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 please subscribe. 
and share the video with a friend, family member, or just someone random. You never know what God can do. Westside members, this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., come a little bit early, we're going to be having a midweek lesson on stewardship. So it's going to be the all West Side, so campus, teens, family ministry, singles, yo pros, Screenland, everyone together. Uh, please come invite your friends. We're going to have a great talk on stewardship, a part two from what occurred last week. Also, many of you are in house groups or house watch parties, house church watch parties. What we're doing is going to be answering the question right now and discussing it within the watch parties that Steve posed earlier. So the two questions are in the, it's in the comment section, so if you miss it, you can just check the comments. But the one first question is, what area of your life is most challenging to transfer power over to Jesus and why? And then the second question is, can you reveal God's image and message? So it's in the chat. Uh, your group leaders should be able to have it, but please spend some time discussing and talking with your house church watch parties together. Thank you so much for joining the West Side Church. We're so grateful to have you, and we will see you all next week. Let the Spirit of the Lord Let it rise, rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord Let it rise, rise among us. us. Let the praises of our King we rise, rise among us. Let it rise, let it rise. Let it rise. Oh, 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 yeah. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord. Let the 
stand in my place as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Oh. 